Hmm. Grace and peace to you in the name of our brother Jesus. It is so good to be back with everyone after a week away. Uh, I know Heather covered the main event at Synod, and so I would just say one of the things I really enjoy about um, the National Gathering for the UCC is I get to see um, folks I haven't seen since. It's like camp friends. It's like, oh, I see you at camp, but it's conferences, so it's important and grown up. Um, but anyway, people will ask me what I'm doing. I say, well, I'm doing a new church start, and they're like, what do you? What's that about, or what do you like about that? I say it's really good because we can say, what should church be like, and then we can do it. So I appreciate all of you uh, being part of this. Uh, maybe not appreciate. I'm really grateful that there are folks who are as excited about good church as I am and uh, want to be a part of something new and exciting and a little bit different, a little bit crazy, right? Um, so. Thinking about the practice of forming communities, doing new churches, I did want to talk about the, the sermon series that we're entering into here. Um, for the next two months, we're going to be reading and following the story of Moses and Aaron and Miriam and the Israelites as God forms them into a people through the course of the book of Exodus. So now it might be that you love the Bible and you have your own copy with plenty of highlights. I believe there's at least one or two people here who have who that is the case for, uh, and that's awesome. And it might be, too, that you would have to dig around in the basement to find your copy of the Bible, but you would always thought that it would be nice to know a little more about it. Both those things are great. So for the Bible Savvy, uh, we, uh, what we're doing is, along with the sermon series, there's opportunities to read a uh, chapter each day of Exodus and to uh, follow along. So if you're already Bible savvy, it's your opportunity to read a chapter a day and say, okay, what is Amy going to pick out of these five chapters to do as the sermon, right? Um, so just add it to your daily reading, right? Just put a chapter on. No biggie. But if, this is, if the Bible is new for you, then see if you can't find a newer translation, like the Message or the Common English Bible, or ask me, I can talk you through it. Um, since the King James is classic and beautiful, but a little tough for beginners. And set aside 10 or 15 minutes, maybe over breakfast, or as you're getting ready for bed, to read a chapter. And if something stands out to you, if you have a word or a phrase or even an idea... See if you can't carry it with you into your day or into your prayers at night. Reading plus reflection becomes the spiritual practice. And then we'll have to talk about it, how it's going next week. Um, so with all that being said, let's start our reflection together with a sung prayer. And if you know this song, please sing with me. Let us pray. Open our eyes, Lord. We want to see Jesus, to reach out and touch Him, and know that we love Him. Open our eyes, Lord, and help us to listen. Open our eyes, Lord, we want to see Jesus. Amen. Okay, so let's say you're in the family business, which is taking care of sheep, animal husbandry, if you will, at cocktail parties, you like to say uh, livestock specialist, and you like your father-in-law, and you want to contribute to the well-being of the flock by being an excellent shepherd. And that's even more the case because he doesn't ask a lot of questions about why you left Egypt and that's a good thing, because you were on the run, actually, and worried about being caught after killing a guy, an Egyptian, when you saw him mistreating a Hebrew slave, a fellow Hebrew, one of your relatives. You killed the man, but someone saw you, and so you headed for the hills, and now you're in the hills, and it's something you'd rather avoid talking about. And the new family is very happy to have you and to give you one of their daughters to marry and to put you right to work. Still, after growing up as the adopted son of an Egyptian princess, with all the beauty and elegance of the royal court, the learning, the astronomy, the writing, and the fine speeches, and the grand possibilities of being at the center of the known world, after all that, it's kind of a big change to spend hours and hours, days and days, out in a field watching sheep eat and then looking around for new grass so they can eat some more, and strings, streams so they can drink some water. It can get a little dull. So you think, maybe I'll take these sheep someplace new, 
and see what's across the wilderness. See what that mountain is like over there. It could be interesting, right? So you take a detour, you go a little out of your way, and you get way more than you bargained for. At the end of the book of Genesis, which is more or less where Joseph's story ends, the story we were following in, through June, Israel, who is the ancestor of all the Israelites, hence the name Israelites, comes to Egypt with all his children and grandchildren, and they settle down. But as the generations pass, the Egyptians forget about Joseph and enslave the Israelites, also known as the Hebrews. In the meantime, the 70 Israelites turned into thousands upon thousands. And the power of the slaves, their number and their strength, strike fear into the men who have enslaved them. And they start trying to kill off the baby boys. Moses escapes from this when his mother puts him in a floating basket in the Nile River. And a princess hears him crying and t decides to adopt him. And then unwittingly hires his own mother as his nurse. He grows up at court, which is understandably an ambiguous position to be in. You're known as a Hebrew, but you're treated like Egyptian royalty. He's in this strange in-between position, not truly loyal to the Egyptians, but not accepted by the Hebrews either, which might make him exactly the right person to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. And so we get to a burning bush, out in the middle of the wilderness. That's where we are when our text starts today. God is waiting for Moses and attracts his attention with a fireworks display. And when it works, Moses walks over. When Moses walks over to see what's going on, God knows he's caught. Moses, guess what I'm going to do? I've heard all about the awful things that the Hebrews are suffering from, and I've seen how terrible it is, and I'm going to put an end to it. And I'm sure Moses is thinking, great, great, this sounds great. I'm so glad someone notices how bad things are. It's got so terrible, you don't even know. Finally, someone's going to do something about it. I didn't realize who the God of the Hebrews was, but, oh, uh oh I should probably be keeping my eyes covered, oops. But finally, someone with power and authority is going to reach in and take care of everything. And God is still talking and finally winds up by saying, And so, since all these terrible things are happening, I'm going to take action by sending you. Right? And if Moses had been drinking coffee, I'm pretty sure he would have spit it out right at that exact moment. Pfft. Right? What? Sorry, spit tank? Okay. Send me? You can't do that. That's crazy. That's ridiculous. What about this? What about this? And God has answers for all of it. Finally, Moses tries one other gambit. Wait, now, who are you again? Are you really the God of the Hebrews? What if they've never heard of you? It's worth a shot, right? Question the messenger, even when, in this case, the messenger is literally the creator of the universe. right? And then here's where it gets pretty interesting. God tells Moses the divine name which is not something that had come up before in the course of the Bible story and there's a certain power in knowing someone's name have you ever been on a playground and the kids are misbehaving and then someone comes along who knows their names right it can put a stop to the shenanigans pretty quick right I feel like there's some teachers in the room who know that principle yeah okay yeah by telling Moses this name Yahweh, as we sort of pronounce it now, becomes more specific to him, to the Hebrews, and in the process becomes more bound up with this particular people. God has been with them since this people was a single couple waiting for a very late in life baby. And now the relationship is deepening. God is forming this family into a people, a people in relationship with their creator. The name is like a down payment on God's covenant with the Israelites. The covenant for a good land and a good life in service not to Egyptians, but to the God who sees and knows and loves them and practices true justice. The covenant is at the heart of the story of Exodus. So today we're going to take communion together. And that covenant, that story about God's grace through Jesus, is an echo, is a new variation on the covenant that God forged with Moses and the Israelites those many years ago. And so as we eat and drink, 
taking the bread and juice into our own bodies, we remember Jesus together, and we remember the God who is continually drawing closer and closer to us out of love and out of a bone-headed desire to save us and to bless us and to create something beautiful with us. May we renew our covenant to God in gratitude for the covenants that bind us. By the grace of Jesus. Amen.